Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to Impact Cyber Church, where we are changing the way the world sees God. You say, well, why do you want to change the way the world sees God? Because I'll tell you something. If you've got a messed up view of God, if you've got an unscriptural view of God, if your view of God is anything different than what Jesus showed us, and then you're not going to have much victory in your life. This stuff is not going to work really well for you. But you know what? When you see God through who Jesus is, you fall in love with God. You fall in love with the people around you. Your life, your faith starts working. And man, that's what we do. Now listen, we are going to introduce you to one of the most important concepts that you've got to get hold of if you want to live in victory now, but especially in days to come. And this is based on my book, Satan Unmasked. Now, if you read my book, don't think you've got it all because I'm going to take you to some places about understanding your position over Satan in ways you never imagined. And we're going to put an end to the fear. We're going to put an end to all the negativity. We're going to put an end to anything that would make you afraid of the devil and afraid to move forward with God. I'll be right back. Don't go away. Man, I got a great download for you this month. It's fight your very last battle with the devil. You know something? I'm going to teach you how to live in victory. No more fighting at the, with the devil. No more screaming at the devil. No more chasing demons around. You're going to win a victory. It's going to last forever. Listen, just click right here right now and get this free download. Listen, today we're going to deal with some things I'm, that I'm telling you, this is the truth. I am going to teach you how to live in a victory over the devil that's going to be unlike anything you may have ever experienced. Let, let me just ask you some simple questions. Would you like, first and foremost, to never be afraid of the devil again? You know, so many people... People are afraid. They're afraid to move forward. They're afraid to step out. They're afraid to do anything because they're afraid the minute they do, the devil is going to attack them. Well, I got news for you. You never have to be afraid again. You, how would you like to never be concerned about the devil attacking you? How would you like to know that any plan that you launch, he could never, ever stop it? He could never, ever bring your plans to nothing. And how would you like to know that you will always win every single struggle that you'll ever face? Well, let me tell you something. That's where we're going to go in this series. And again, even if you've read my book, Satan Unmasked, you want to, you want to stick with me with this series because I'm going to tell you something. It's going to take you even to victories beyond what I discussed in this book. Today, we're going to be talking about where do I stand with the devil? We're going to be answering that question, really. And you're the one that's got to answer that question. Now, here's the deal. The truth with the most potential to set you free is always the truth that has the most potential to offend you. Now you say, well, no, if something's going to help me, if it's going to set me free, it, there's no way that it, that it could offend me. Well, actually it could. Because you see, if I'm not living in victory in some area of my life, then it's obvious in that area of my life, I'm not walking in truth. I, I, I might think I know the truth. I might intend to walk in the truth. I might be trying to apply what I believe is the truth. But if it's not working, it's not working. Now, what that means is I am going to have to face some area of my life. Say, whoa, what I believe in this area of my life may not really be truth. It really may not be as rooted in God's word as I thought. Well, remember, the mind always seeks to protect your ego. So the first thing that happens when we get challenged with a truth that we desperately need uh, to set us free from whatever our current circumstance is, the first thing that's going to happen is our ego is going to fight against that truth because we don't want to be wrong. We will do almost anything to prevent being wrong, even stay in the current pain. Now, we don't ever intellectually say, you know what, I'd rather stay in pain than be wrong. It's just that that's the way our mind works. But whenever we start answering the question, where do I stand with the devil? Really, you can put it to yourself this way. And you're, you've got to answer this question. Now, I want you to, before this program is over, you've got to decide where you stand on this issue. Do I stand before uh, the devil pr prior to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection or after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? Now, stop and think about it. 
There are so many doctrines that are taught out there about spiritual warfare that are based on things that are rooted in the Old Testament prior to Jesus coming, winning a battle over the devil, giving us absolute victory, being raised from the dead. And so it's amazing how many people, when it comes to spiritual warfare, really when it comes to healing or many things, they're relating to God as if we're still in the old covenant. They're relating to God as if Jesus never came and never did anything about what we're facing. So am I facing the devil based on how it was before Jesus' resurrection or after Jesus' resurrection? Or here's another one. Do I stand in God based on the finished work of Jesus or do I stand in God based on religious culture? You know, it's amazing what people believe about the devil and about spiritual warfare that not only is not in the Bible, but in fact contradicts the Bible. More than that, it contradicts what the Bible says about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, I want to tell you something. No believer I know wants to or willfully contradicts the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I've never, I've never met a person that wanted to, but I have met people that were so entrenched, that were doctrinally entrenched in their ideology to such a degree that they were not willing to admit it when in fact what they believed put them in direct opposition to the cross of Christ. And I got news for you. I don't care how much faith you got. I don't care what you believe about what you believe. I don't care, you know, you know, I don't care what the circumstances or the situation. If what you believe and if what you're trying to function in your life is is not rooted in the death, burial, and resurrection, or especially if it's opposed to the death, burial, and resurrection, it is not going to work. And there's a lot of reasons why you might think it's working, but I'll tell you something. I'm, I'm going to take you to a place of victory, and that's unlike anything you may have never known before. Now, identity is core, because remember, everything's about the heart, and the heart's all about identity. But there's three aspects or sources are roots of identity that we have to be absolutely biblically based, absolutely new covenant based. And if any one of these three areas are not congruent with the finished work of Jesus, we are going to struggle. Number one, we've got to have an absolute identi identity or knowledge of the identity of God. See, part of the problem that we face in life is people don't really know God. Now, they know an idea of God. They know what their tradition teaches them about God. They know what their Bible school taught them about God. They know what their family believes about God. But see, the knowledge of God, first and foremost, is something, is something that's experiential. It's not about knowing the information that somebody else knows. It's about experiencing something based on the revelation that Jesus gave us about, about God. Now, see, if I have a belief about God that I cannot uh, line up with or I can't base it with, it's not consistent with how Jesus lived, what Jesus taught, uh, what he accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection, then that is what the Bible calls a vain imagination. It is not truly a revelation of God. It is not showing me who God is. It's showing me who I want God to be, who I need for God to be so I can feel good about myself. So we've got to have the true identity of God. Now, just, just think of how many things people believe that contradict the name of God. His name is Jehovah Ropha, the Lord God that heals, but people believe God make, that God will make them sick. How can that be? How would he contradict his own name? People say that he is the God of peace, Jehovah Shalom. Yet many people believe that he will torment you and take you into tribulation as a way to teach you something. Then he's going to contradict his own name. He's going to deny his own name. I mean, you can just go down the list of the names of God and identify 
places in your life or in the lives of people around you that are struggling where they believe something contradictory to the name of God. They believe something contradictory to what Jesus revealed about God through his life, his teachings, his death, burial, and resurrection. Then, of course, secondly, we've got to believe the truth about ourselves. We've got to see ourselves as who we really are in Jesus. It's, you know, we can't have any opinion of ourselves. If, again, if we can't base it on being in Christ and who he is before God. See, now, if I know who he is in the resurrection, if I know who he is, as the risen Lord. And if I have believed on him and I'm in him, then I can't see myself any way other than how he is right now before God. And then the, the third identity we've got to sort out is we have got to know absolutely who the devil is. And when we know his identity and know his nature, then understanding his strategies is incredibly simple. Listen, you should never be taken by surprise by any of the devil's strategies. If you are, it's usually not because you're a bad person. It's not because you don't love God. It's not because you're not spiritual, but it's simply because you don't understand his nature as the word of God describes it. So listen, I'm going to come back in just a few minutes. We're going to dive headlong in this stuff. I promise you this is going to be a journey that you're going to love to make. Don't go away. I'll be right back. My brand new series on Satan Unmasked is going to open your eyes to who Satan is since the resurrection of Jesus and show you how to have absolute victory all the time. No more fear, no more dreading, no more thinking that he's going to attack you, no more living in guilt and condemnation. Listen, the days that lay ahead, if we're going to live as overcomers, we've got to know who God is. We've got to know who Jesus is. We've got to know what we have in Jesus. And we've got to know who Satan really is. And I'm going to unmask him with the word of God. And for the first time, you're going to see who he really is. You're going to see and understand what really happened to him through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And you're going to understand your victory in him is absolute. I mean, I'm telling you, it is a done deal. This is going to make walking with God where you don't even have to consider what the devil's doing. You don't have to worry about what the devil's doing. You're going to be free to focus on God and all of his promises. So one of the things I've got to ask myself is this. If the way I respond to or react to or do warfare or fight with the devil, uh, is, it, is it confirming the word of God or is it denying the word of God? Is it confirming the victory that Jesus gave us at the cross or is it denying the victory that Jesus gave us at the cross? You know, I tell you, I can, I can remember when, how I related to spiritual warfare, the devil, demon. I can remember the day that all of this changed. I was actually doing my undergraduate work in theology and I was doing off-campus studies and I was in another city doing a crusade and I'd actually moved there for the time of the crusade and to stay and, and to do some discipleship work after the crusade. And so, so I had really not been around spirit-filled people very much. So see, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit at home by myself within the first two weeks after I was born again. I, and it just happened because I was praying, I was just seeking God, and, and I experienced this whole thing, had no idea what it was, and, you know, just worshiped God in other tongues and never made a big deal out of it. To me, it was just not, it was just not a big deal. And so when I started getting around uh, people that consider themselves, you know, spirit-filled, call themselves spirit-filled, I noticed that they had this incredible emphasis on the devil. Man, they were always about fighting the devil. They were always about doing spiritual warfare. And, you know, I, I just kind of thought, well, they, they know more than I do, so I need, to, I need to listen to these people. And so, so, you know, when they would pray about something, most of their prayer life was more about screaming at the devil than it was, you know, declaring the promises of God. And so I, I had trouble with that. I, honestly, I, I really, really struggled with it. But when I went in to do this, this crusade, there was actually a witch's coven on this campus that decided that they were going to do spiritual warfare against me and they were going to speak curses over me. Well, man, all of the local really spiritually minded or they thought they were spiritually minded people, man, they started warning me about all this stuff. I'm telling you, I began to have bizarre demonic manifestations that were just like something you would see in the exorcist. I mean, 
terrible things started happening. And there were, there were you know, physical things were moving in my apartment and, and, and all kinds of things were happening. It was, I don't want to go into the detail because I don't want to magnify the devil. Man, I'm telling you what it got to where I dreaded seeing sundown every night because it's like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to face something else scary tonight. And it was tormenting me. It was driving me crazy. And so one day I was, I was reading the word of God and I was, I was reading John 14. I came across where Jesus said, He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also and greater than these because I'm going to the Father. And you know, I began to think about it and I, and I began to realize I don't remember one time that Jesus ever rebuked the devil and he came against him stronger. You know, that was a popular doctrine back in the 70s and 80s and still among some people. You know, man, you, you rebuke the devil, he's he going to come against you stronger. And, you know, I began to think about that. And I thought, that's not even in the Bible. The Bible says if, if, if we rebuke the devil, he, he flees from us. And, and, you know, I just began to think about Jesus' ministry in comparison to what I was seeing among most spirit-filled, charismatic, Pentecostal type believers. And I realized that what I was seeing uh, was not manifest in the life and the ministry of Jesus. And it was not manifest in the life and the ministry of the apostles. It just, it just didn't happen. And there were not demonic manifestations all the time. And if a demon manifested in somebody, uh, they quickly took authority over it. And that was pretty much the end of it. And it didn't come against them harder. And they didn't, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd go to these meetings and you'd see people start to try to cast the devil out of somebody. They'd roll around and fight on the floor and, and carry on. And, and it was crazy. I mean, it was just bizarre. And so I can remember, because keep in mind, Jesus showed us two incredible things when he came. Number one, he showed us exactly what God would do, what God would say, what God would look like, how God would interpret and apply his word. In other words, he was God in the flesh. He showed us the, what God would really look like. But the second thing that he showed us is he showed us what a man or a human being feel or yield it to the Holy Spirit look like. And so we have the perfect representation of who God was, but we also have the perfect representation of a man filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what the Bible tells us in the book of Acts, that, that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil you know, because of the Holy Spirit. He yielded to the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. So I will never forget it. It was raining outside. All kinds of creepy things were happening. And, and I remember I stood up in this little apartment that I was staying in. And I just kind of put my hands up. And I, and I began to look around in my apartment. And I said, this is it. Jesus didn't fight with you. Jesus didn't scream and holler at you. You didn't fight with him. The apostles didn't scream and holler and fight with you and roll around and, and try to pull you out of the heavens and do all of these kinds of things. And I'm not going to. And I made this statement. I said, you will never manifest in my presence again right now in the name of Jesus. You know something? All of that nonsense ended right there that night. Now, let me tell you, it doesn't just stop there. And that, that you know, <clears throat> all those goofy things happen. But, you know, years later, when I began to do a crusades overseas, you have to understand, witch doctors tried to kill me many times overseas. Witch doctors would show up at my crusades. Witch doctors would show up. At, and, and, you know, some of you have heard me tell about this. I was doing a, a crusade in Honduras, and on the, on the hill behind us, there were a whole row of witch doctors, and they had on these, these uh, head masks that went, you know, that went almost all the way to the ground, and they were up there chanting curses. And, and man, my, my uh, interpreters, they just about freaked out. What are we going to do? we gotta, we got to fight the devil. I said, no, 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 we're not even going to acknowledge the devil. We, I just kept preaching. They just kept interpreting. Thousands of people got saved. Thousands of people got healed. Thousands of people got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And we never one time even rebuked the devil. Never even one time acknowledged that they were back there. In the Philippines, I've had the same kinds of things happen. Even here in the States, I remember one time a Satan worshiper came to burn my house down. And, uh, you know, the, uh, actually he later told me about it because I, I, I met him and witnessed to him. 
And uh, this guy had a pentagram tattooed on his chest, came to my house to burn it down. And when he walked onto my property, he fell out under the power of God, began to scream so loud that a neighbor had to come and drag him off of my property before he could stand up. Let me tell you something. These concepts that we have of the devil being this powerful, almighty person that we've got to fight with, these things do not confirm what the Word of God shows us about what we can do. If we can do what Jesus did and more, if Jesus emptied himself and became a man and yielded to the Holy Spirit and used the power of God by the Holy Spirit, then so can we. Everything that he did, we can do and more according to his own word. So if I'm fighting with and screaming with and rolling around and afraid of and, and struggling with the devil, then I am not confirming the Word of God. I am denying the Word of God. But even worse... I am not confirming the absolute victory that Jesus had over the devil at the resurrection. I am denying it. And I tell you what, none of us want to do that. That ended my struggle with, with Satan that day. That, that, that was the end of it. And you know something? Uh, you know, since then, I'll go places where people are fighting and rolling around on the floor and carrying on. And, and, you know, and I just walk in and just basically say, just... Stop. You cannot manifest in my presence. And the minute I do that, all the showing out and carrying on stops. You know, the book of Colossians and second chapter says this, and we're going to talk a lot about this passive scripture. It says in verse 13, it says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he, that is Jesus, made alive together with him. So we have been made alive to go with him. Just that right there tells me that if I am alive with him, if I'm alive in him, then Satan cannot touch me without touching him. Do you think Satan can touch Jesus? Do you think Satan is, is any kind of a match for Jesus? You see, we are, we are hid in him. You know, when I, was a, when I was a little boy, my brother and I thought like, cats and dogs. I mean, I'm telling you, we were brutal to each other, but we stuck up for each other. And there was some guy that was a couple of years ahead of me in school. Man, he always wanted to beat me up, but there was one problem, and that is he had to get past my brother to do that. Now, I wasn't enough to handle him. He could have pulverized me and beat me in the ground, but you know what? He couldn't get past my big brother. And every time he ever came around and was going to try to pick on me or intimidate me, I don't know how it happened, but somehow my brother always showed up and beat the daylights out of him. You know something? I, I really got to where I didn't worry about that guy. It was, sort of like, it was sort of like standing under the shadow of the Almighty, except I was standing under the shadow of my brother. Let me tell you something. Satan can't get to you in Jesus it just can't happen. So it goes on to say, so he's made us alive together with him. That word with could be with or it could be in. It says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, which he has taken out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over in it. And this is what Jesus did. At the cross, when he was raised from the dead, he disarmed all principalities and powers and made a public spectacle over them by triumphing in this, in, the, in what? In the cross, in the resurrection. Now, this is the primary decision you've got to make. There's some questions that you've got to ask yourself. And just in a moment, we're going to, we're going to talk really specifically about these in the mentoring moment. But the key is this, you know, am I, go, am, I going to, am I going to interpret everything that I believe about God? Am I going to interpret everything I believe about the devil? Am I going to interpret everything I believe about life based on the fact that I'm in Jesus and Jesus is raised from the dead? That's our, that's our ultimate question. And until we answer that question, until we're immovable, about our answer to that question. Until that question becomes the foundation of all of our beliefs, it becomes the place that we stand, it becomes the core of our heart's beliefs. Until then, the real truth is, our faith has no root, it has no foundation, and has very little opportunity for living in victory. I'll be back with a mentoring moment. Don't go away.
Listen, if you really want to unravel all this in your life and you want to live in the victory that Jesus has given you, be sure and click now and download your series of Satan Unmasked. I'm telling you what, victory is yours. It's time to start living it today. I want to invite you to a outstanding meeting that we're going to be having in Edmonton, Canada, promoted by Docs and Ministries there. We are going to be having a Dignity and Worth seminar. I want to tell you something. Dignity and Worth is one of those foundational truths that once you have a biblically based sense of self-worth, so many other factors in your life begin to come together. As a matter of fact, you can just end so many of life's struggles just by knowing who you are in Jesus and being able to experience who you are, feel right about yourself, feel the love of God. And we're going to have a workbook for you. This is going to be tremendous and it's going to start on March the 31st, and it's going to go through April the 2nd. If you're interested in attending that, uh, you can check our website or you can check Doxa Ministries in Canada. You don't want to miss this. This is absolutely going to be a life changer. Listen, before we jump into the mentoring moment, I want you to do something for me that will help me touch lives all over the world. Right now, on the bottom of the screen, just click on the like button. And then immediately at the end of the mentoring moment, if you'll just take a few seconds and subscribe to my YouTube channel, you cannot imagine what a difference that will make and how many people will see and hear these messages. The more people that like it, the more people that subscribe to it, the more it is promoted to people all over the world. Now listen, we started this, this message out by asking, where do you stand with the devil? And you, you've got to make that decision. Do I stand where Jesus stood with the devil? You remember I told you the story about, about the time when I just said, you know something, Paul didn't do this, Jesus didn't do this, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to have these struggles, I'm not going to have demonic manifestations, I'm not going to be afraid, I am not going to have doubts, I am going to believe that I am in Christ, therefore I'm a new creation. I'm going to believe that everything that He did, I can do because He is in me. I'm going to believe that I have the same Holy Spirit that He has, and because I do, I, I have the same power that was at work in Him. So answer this question, where do I really stand with the devil? Do I allow or do I fear things happening in my life that never happened in the life of Jesus? Do I fear things happening in my life or happening to me? Or do I fear the devil doing things that never happened to Jesus, never happened to Paul? As you'll learn in next week's message, those kinds of fears are what we call vain imaginations. And those kinds of fears can drive your life. They'll make you afraid to move forward because you're afraid if you move forward, you might come under attack. They'll make you afraid that if you, if you take authority over the devil in your life, in your circumstances, that he's going to come against you harder. So sit down and, and take, just from your knowledge of the Gospels, just take some scriptures or your knowledge in general of Jesus' life and write down a character sketch. This is me. I always have victory over the devil. I'm filled with the same Holy Spirit as Jesus. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. The devil cannot touch me unless he first tries to touch Jesus, and he can never touch Jesus. And establish who you really are and what you really have and where you really stand.